Uh, I hope you don't regret it, but uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to start by talking about something I think we've had a bit of a compact about not mentioning up until now. It's coming down the tracks. We can't avoid it. I apologise for this. It's the B word. <laughs> I'm going to start, I'm afraid, with Brexit. Um, and I'm going to start with the referendum, unfortunately, and I'm going to start with some of the findings of the referendum. I should mention it briefly and then move on, so don't panic too much. Um, and one fascinating finding about the way people voted in 2016 in the referendum was that 70% of people who self-identified as British voted Remain, and 70% of people who self-identified as English voted to leave, which raises a whole sequence of really fascinating questions. And I think does reaffirm uh, a particular view that Englishness is a kind of conservative identity. And there's an enormous amount of work being done about this at the moment. People like Mike Kenny and, and others are writing about this. An identity that could be, could be summed up, I think, by one of the famous paintings by Helen Allingham there on the, the right, the cottage homes of England, that idea of enormous blood and soil nationalism that is part of the English identity. Um, I don't think that's accurate. And I think a lot of the work that was done by historians on a study of Englishness was done by historians who stood politically on the left of the left of the political spectrum, people like E.P. Thompson and others. Um, and they were drawn particularly to a kind of subversive kind of Englishness, if you like, an Englishness that was subterranean, that was insubordinate. Um, and it's the kind of Englishness much quoted in, in the 19th century uh, in the words of Daniel Defoe, and you can see it there, when he talks famously in the 18th century about the true-born Englishman, he said, from this ill-born amphibious mob began that vain, ill-natured thing, an English man. Now, the fascinating thing about that quotation, it's fascinating in all kinds of ways, but one fascinating thing is that it implicitly acknowledges that Englishness comes from somewhere else, the idea of amphibiousness. Historians of the left were far less interested in Britishness, actually, partly because Britishness was seen as an imperial identity, which drew on imperial tropes, uh, and also because Britishness was very largely about the state and less about culture and the folk. Fascinatingly, a lot of the people who were drawn to Britishness were historians who came from somewhere else, or people like E.J. Hobsbawm, for example, who was a, a refugee and a migrant, of course, from Nazi Germany and Austria. Uh, people like Raphael Samuel, who was Jewish from a metropolitan background. They found a home in Britishness and weren't drawn to Englishness in the way that so many historians of the indigenous left in Britain were. And it's them I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, and then I'll talk about some of the broader issues that emerge from this. I've got to mention Morris Dancing. I can't not mention Morris Dancing. Um, if there are any Morris Dancers in the room, you know who you are. Um, I should say, one of the most troubling aspects of Brexit for me, and there are many, is the fact that there's been an absolute surge in the number of Morris Dancing groups since Brexit, and the membership of those groups as well has also increased. But traditionally, Morris dancing came out of a number of folk revivals organised and orchestrated by people like Cecil Sharp, and most of those folk revivals were folk revivals that were curated by people on the political left. I don't know if you've read Barbara Castle's fabulous autobiography, but paragraph two is about her organising Morris dancing sessions for children on the railway sidings in Pontrefract which seems a bit out of character, but there it is, born in 1910, Barbara Castle. So still very much a lived tradition then. Uh, and it shot through with a, with a sort of Arcadian dreaming, really, a sense of nostalgia for an older Britain, a more traditional Britain, uh, a more traditional England, an England of village culture and village greens. You can see there on the left, John Spargo's socialist readings for children. It was absolutely de rigueur in early socialist and labour and labour culture for children to learn how to Morris dance. John Spargo, of course, very interested in Morris dancing because he was brought up in the west of England. And in the ILP songbook there, 16 songs for sixpence. Again, you get that strong sense of an Arcadian English, very English past. I have said that it's historians of the left who traditionally have been very interested in Englishness, and I think that that's true. If you think of people like E.P. Thompson, for example, what's his most famous book? You all know this, 
the making of the English working class. Where's Wales? Where's Scotland? Barely feature. Where's the West Country? That barely features, actually. And there are lots of reasons for that. The whole group of historians, people like Christopher Hill, people like A.L. Morton, less well known now than he was, people like uh, um, E.P. Thompson himself, grew out of the popular front tradition of the period 1934 through to 1939. And this was a period when the Communist Party in Great Britain was very, very interested really in mining authentic local indigenous culture, if you like, as a counterpoint to movements that were drawing really on nationalist ideas, uh, whether it was fascism, whether it was Baldwinite conservatism. So all those historians grow out of the work of the Communist Party Historians Group, and they were all interested in identifying an authentic folk culture of one kind or another so they could wrest back English patriotism from the political right. And it's through that that you get E.P. Thompson's interest in, for example, folk customs and folk culture, perhaps best embodied in his very famous book, Customs in Common, uh, which came out, of course, in the middle 1990s. Of course, if you draw upon an authentically English tradition of politics and popular memory and create a narrative around that, you're going to create, if you like, a demonology, you're going to create a martyrology. And that demonology and martyrology of English villains and heroes was very, very marked really in the 1880s, 1890s, and in the early part of the 20th century in the build-up to the formation of the independent Labour Party, which saw itself as, if you like, the custodian of a certain kind of English insubordination. This is Keir Hardy, of course, writing about that martyrology, talking about the great statesman, really, who will symbolise the union between the people and the middle classes, and these are people who come out of a tradition of revolt, as he saw it. And you can see some of the famous names he mentions. You would inevitably expect to see them here. Of course, John Ball, Gerard Wynne Stanley, Thomas More, uh, Robert Owen, Ernest Jones, Frederick Denison Morris, Frederick Harrison, uh, Connell Manning, William Morris, etc. I have to say, you couldn't get any of these people in the same room and with any kind of agreement between them, quite frankly. But the fascinating thing for me is we're talking here about Keir Hardy, a Scotsman. We're talking about someone who came really from an authentic Scottish tradition of protest, buying through into this narrative of revolt and rebellion in England. Uh, where does it all begin? Well, the ILP is fascinating on this, mining deep into the narrative of English history. Uh, my favourite writer on this is Joseph Clayton, of course, Leeds ILP member in the early part of the 20th century. He argued very strongly it goes back to someone you've probably never heard of, actually, William Fitz Osbert, Longbeard, who led a rebellion against Richard I in 1193. And you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to explore the whole of that tradition right the way through to the 1880s or 1890s because we would be here all day. But everybody has a bit part to play in this, no matter where you come from, from the lowliest peasant through to the mightiest and most magisterial kingly figure. Of course, King Alfred co-opted, you'll be surprised to know, into the campaign for the eight-hour day in the 1890s and 1900s because he talked about dividing the diurnal round into eight-hour segments, automatically making him a proponent of limited working time at work, or so Sidney Webb argued in a very famous pamphlet in the 1900s. So it's a tradition that goes way back, and almost anybody can feature in it. Fascinating. I think that's the thing that's most interesting about it. Um, what are the characteristics that are mined in this kind of narrative? Well, some of it draws on Stephen Yeo's uh, description of a certain kind of oppositional Englishness. That is the Englishness that, as I've said, is insubordinate. Is an Englishness that seeks to bring down your betters, the one that seeks to cock a snook at those who think they are better than they ought to be. Uh, this whole idea was developed very strongly in Peter Mandler's very significant work on the English national character, the history of an idea from Edmund Burke to Tony Blair. And this is really an Englishness of the, Englishness of the little man, if you like, opposed to the state. Does any of this sound familiar at all? Technocracy bureaucracy, elites of one kind or another, Prussianism, as it was known in the 1890s. Prussianism is really the state doing 
a whole range of things and the community far less. And much opposed, I think, at the time. It's an Englishness of volunteering as well. And English people actually volunteer much more uh, than their European compatriots. It's an interesting side of English life, actually, that volunteering is hardwired into the English soul, really. But also the idea of the amateur, not the professional. Dare I say, not the expert. <laughs> Have we had enough of experts? I'm not sure. Um, and also unpaid professional and enthusiasts. Stephen Yeo was particularly interested in J.T.W. Mitchell, the famous cooperator who was instrumental in the foundation of the Northern Cooperative Movement. But particularly, Englishness on the left was always seen as something that was about the municipal. It was about the local. It was about Joshua Toulmin Smith, who famously opposed state centralization, who famously argued the state shouldn't be doing things. It should be the community that should be doing them. Uh, and this is a, something hardwired into the English soul that goes right the way back, of course, to the Anglo-Saxon folk moot, he famously argued in his book, The Parish. Uh, something Thomas Kirkup took up as well, very enthusiastically in the 1890s, 1900s too. I mention him simply because it was the one book on socialism that Mao Zedong read before he assumed power in 1949. So there's a rather strange outgrowth of a lot of these kinds of ideas of localism and the municipal and the insurgent in Chinese communism. So you might be surprised I've ended up there with that particular reference. Um, the other big issue is the English, of course, as a spiritual people. And you all know, of course, that dissent, nonconformity, an essential part of the radical platform right the way through the 19th century into the early part of the 20th, of course, that famous description of E.P. Thompson by Raphael Samuel as the last of the English dissenters, very much part of that tradition. Sometimes uh, depicted as being about the English as a kind of Protestant elect. And there certainly was something of that growing out of the Reformation and post-Reformation period. But by the end of the 19th century, you've got a strong sense really emerging of the English, not just as Protestant, but actually spiritual. Uh, and it's the spirituality, if you like, of the English country churchyard and the little parish church that are particularly important in a lot of radical readings, really, of the English past. Something that goes back to William Cobbett, something that Robert Blatchford talked about in the Clarion Movement in the 1890s. The idea that at some level, pre-Reformation, there was, if you like, a spiritual unity between community, between priest, between monarch that could be expressed through Catholicism, possibly, or Protestantism later on. So these kinds of issues, I think, are very significant. And at the end of the 19th century, of course, you get a big spiritual religious revival. You see the emergence of Anglo-Catholicism. Catholicism itself comes back in a big way, and the monastic tradition comes back in a big way as well before 1900. And this is all seems part of this highly spiritualized platform that is the essence, if you like, of the English so, where does everybody else fit in? Uh, where do the Welsh fit in? Where do, where do the Scots fit in? Well, it, it turns out that this Englishness is pretty baggy, actually, in the 19th century. Um, these days, of course, we have a much more strongly defined sense of what it is to be Scottish or what it is to be Welsh, not least in Wales around language issues. Uh, but in the 19th century, it's much vaguer than that. Um, there's a very famous book by a man called David Thomas, or famous in Wales, anyway, famous book uh, in Wales, that is uh, the common people in their kingdom, that starts not with England Door or any of the people you'd expect it to start with. No, it starts with Wat Tyler and, and Jack Cade. So it turns out that that tradition can be co-opted. And even in terms of Scotland, um, the work, uh, I think, really, of Colin Kidd has been very illuminating here and shows that for a lot of contemporaries, what it was to be Scot was quite, Scots was quite vague and inchoate. Uh, he believed very strongly that Scots lowlanders, or there was sufficient evidence to suggest that in contemporary terms, Scots lowlanders were seen as part of a broad Anglo-Saxon tradition, and Carnegie talks about this in the 1890s, 1900s, that you can co-opt the Scots lowland people into a broader global pan-imperial unity of Anglo-Saxon Teutonic peoples, leaving Scots in the Highlands as a kind of rump as it were. 
So it turns out this Englishness is very, very baggy indeed. You can appropriate all kinds of elements and strands within it in the 19th century. It's not preclusive, as it were, of a certain kind of Welshness of a cer or of a certain kind of, of Scottishness. And things have changed, I think, very much in that regard. It can also fascinatingly feature in colonial discourses. Uh, and what's particularly interesting is to see the way in which radicals depict anti-colonial protest movements as part of an Anglo-Saxon tradition of revolt. How, you might wonder, how on earth can you reach that conclusion? Well, as you know, the 19th century, the early 20th century, was a period of very strange racial theorizing, for example. Uh, and just to give you one example of that, there was a kind of feeling that at some level the worst excesses of a British imperialism were about the expansion of a kind of neo-Normanism. And that neo-Normanism was not something that an English radical really could subscribe to. But in somewhere like New Zealand, for example, where there was a long-standing war in the 1860s with the Maori, the Maori were depicted as an island people with a navy who conquered other nations, who had a strong martial and military tradition. They were able to fight the British army to its knees. Ergo, they must be descended from Viking ships that had gone off course and actually were Anglo-Saxons. And you see quite a bit of this across the whole discussion of imperial issues in the radical press. The Indian mutiny, sufficient ammunition apparently in all those discourses and discussions about Aryanism for uh, the Indian mutineers to be depicted as a kind of militant Anglo-Saxon in rebellion against a Norman machine. So it can feature in the broader empire and does in the later part of the 19th century, very exotic and quite interesting ways. Um, I should say something about imperial Englishness. I have said that empire tended to be associated with Britishness, and I think that's true. But of course, the most famous book talking about the position of these islands in a global context at the end of the 19th century is Sir John Seeley's book, The Expansion of England. Notice the expansion of England, of course, where he emphasized the empire's global presence through community of race, religion, and interest. And a lot of what he talks about is about a kind of Englishness. We tend to think of Winston Churchill's English-speaking people as being very conservative, actually, but, but actually it was something that was being talked about when he was in the Liberal Party, when he was part of that liberal political culture, so not necessarily so, I think. But what you do see in the broader empire, particularly in the, in the white dominions as they became, is the export of a certain kind of Englishness. Uh, if you looked at rural culture in Britain, it was dying, it was collapsing, it was fading. Where best to revive the English peasantry than in South Australia or in New Zealand? And as you all know, a lot of the tropes that are very much part of those white dominions are about this can be a society that's better than the England that you've left behind. Um, there's a very famous man actually in Australia, well, it's not quite so famous here as he is there, H.F. Tucker, who very famously set out to create idealized village communities that would stand against the expansion of Melbourne in Victoria. And these communities would affirm their Englishness by, yes, you've guessed it, intensive Morris dancing. So a lot of this is exported, and you do see a whole debate right the way through to people like William Charles Wentworth and Dick Seddon in New Zealand about restoring the English peasantry, the English small proprietor in these great vacant lands in Australia, in the Australian colonies, and later on in New Zealand. And fascinatingly, of course, throughout all those periods when the Declaration of Assent Act and the Constitution Bill in Australia weren't housed in Australia at all, there was a copy of the Magna Carta there. Uh, Richard Jefferies, Gilbert White, very, very widely read in the White Dominions in the Australian colonies and elsewhere. So Englishness, in the context in which I'm talking about it, can have a radical inflection in the broader empire. I started out with a slide that showed you something very nostalgic indeed. It's the annual Toll Puddle Festival, which is held, of course, in Dorset, as you all know. Um, that sense of something that's nostalgic, something that appeals to the past, that appeals to past precedent, is something that's very ingrained, I think, on the political left. 
Um, it's something that you see really in discussions of current day politics. It's always been said about the political left in Britain from the 1890s onwards that it always looked to the past rather than to the future. And when in 1945 the Labour Party issued a manifesto called Let Us Face the Future, it was actually a bit of a departure. But there's no doubt that in the later part of the 19th century, there were attempts to think about how you could recreate the Anglo-Saxon peasantry in places like Canada. Here you go, this can be your land for the asking. This is where you can have your home in the West. You may have lost out in Hampshire or Berkshire, but here is a place where you can recreate, if you like, your rural home in parts of the Canadian provinces. But as I say, the tradition does live on, and it lives on particularly, I would say, as, a, as part of a nostalgia on the political left. It manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Are there any Chumba Wumba fans in today? Um, you're keeping quiet, I say. I have to say I'm not one. Um, but for those of you with long memories who can remember when Chumba Wumba was last in the charts, uh, you may remember their English rebel songs from 1381 to 1984, which of course includes a rendition of Gerard Wynn Stanley's The Diggers Song, which I think some of you will be familiar with. So it's something that does live on, it's something that's not died, it's something that's part of the current day narrative of politics, if you like. And it is quite a serious issue for those on the political left. I think there used to be a feeling that Englishness was about eccentricity. Uh, Englishness was about Stanley Spencer. Englishness was about something that was a little bit odd, a little bit out there, something that didn't make a lot of sense, something that was marginal, something that stood on the extreme, something that could be laughed at. I don't think that's the case, and I think all those historians who wrote about this, from E.P. Thompson onwards through to Christopher Hill and all the others, I think, realized that this was quite a significant issue of identity. They were right to identify that as a significant issue of identity because, hey, guess what? It did become an issue of political identity in 2016. So I think I'll leave it on that note. Thank you.